Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for being here this afternoon. My name is Lara Cleton. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the United Nations University Merit in Maastricht, and I'm convening this seminar series on behalf of UNU Merit and Maastricht University. So the migration seminar series invites researchers, practitioners, but also policymakers uh, to discuss their work related to migration in one capacity or the other. Um, before I will introduce today's speaker to you, um, there's a little bit of housekeeping that I need to do. Um, so our speaker's talk uh, today will last for approximately 30 to 40 minutes, um, after which we'll have time for discussion and questions uh, from the audience. I'd like to ask you to keep your questions until after our speaker is done uh, with their presentation. Um, you can either put the question in the chat, then I will make sure to read it out loud for you, or you can raise your hand by using the raise your hand function um, uh, underneath, like the bar at Zoom. Um, and then I will allocate turns and you can open up your mic and your camera then if you want to and ask the question yourself. Um, as I said, uh, you can turn on your camera if you uh, if you like, but please be aware that we are recording the seminar today for distribution later via our YouTube channel. And on our YouTube channel, you can also find recordings of previous migration seminars that we had over the past years if you're interested. But then now let me please introduce our speaker um, for you today. Um, I'm really happy uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Ricardo Safra de Campos um, today. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in human geography at the University of Exeter uh, in the UK, uh, working on population movement in the context of climate change, uh, with a particular research focus on migration, sustainability, and well being. Um, so, his academic work has um, obviously been published uh, in various uh, journals, both disciplinary and interdisciplinary journals, but he is also a contributing author to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so the IPCC. Um, special report on the oceans and the chirosphere in, in a uh, changing climate, which I think is really, uh, really interesting. Would also love to hear more about this later on. Um, today, uh, he's here with us um, to talk about uh, current work into migration decision making, intentions and consequences in the faces of climate change and climate hazards. Uh, he'll, amongst others, speak about the impact of future climate risks on migration intentions, and uh, he'll draw from empirical research uh, done over the past six years uh, in Bangladesh. Um, but he can, of course, introduce all of this way better than I can. So uh, without much further ado, I'd love to give the floor to you. Uh, Ricardo, thank you so much uh, for being here today. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for uh, the introduction and thanks for the invitation to talk to you and the members of the Migration uh, Research Group and the Migration Seminar Series. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm actually uh, in the Netherlands at the minute. I'm in Rotterdam, so not far from many of you. Um, and um, I look forward to discussing um, the state of the art uh, on climate change and migration research. Uh, so let me share my screen. And just please let me know if you can see my it's Perfect. Thank perfect. you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I've got about essentially 40 slides. So there's a lot of um, uh, themes here that I'd like to cover. We might be able to cover all of them. And I just wanted to flag that this uh, presentation is essentially based on um, a range of empirical research that I've conducted uh, with colleagues uh, in uh, Ghana, uh, India, Bangladesh, and across other countries. So I'd like just to uh, start off by acknowledging uh, that none of this work would have been able to be um, completed without support from those colleagues. Um, so mainstream media, let's just start with the uh, bombastic headlines that we have seen um, over the years on the topic of climate change and migration. And quite often, really, what we tend to um, see in those headlines is uh, numbers and very large numbers. So we see the first uh, headline there, um, basically telling us that uh, climate crisis could displace about 1.2 billion people by 2050. Uh, the next one suggests that 200 million climate refugees um, have fled their homes um, and estimating that by 250, those numbers will continue to increase. Um, Indian islands that have been slipping under water um, obviously, uh, this will be um, become even more prevalent because of sea level rise. And even in the UK, where I am I'm currently based, um, they have been talking about climate change refugees. And in fact, an entire um, coastal village in Wales is being decommissioned uh, 
um, because of um, coastal erosion, with all of these population being um, relocated elsewhere in uh, England and Wales. So mm, a lot of media um, uh, discourse, negative discourse, really based on these bombastic projections of billions of people being displaced, very little agency, and um, obviously this has uh, negative uh, repercussions uh, around uh, migration more broadly. Um, but we need to just start, before we start talking about empirical findings, just position ourselves really within um, the state of the art in terms of research on climate change and migration. And I think some of you might be very familiar with this diagram here, it's the drivers of migration. So this um, stems um, from the Foresight uh, report published in 2011 by the Government Office uh, for Science in the UK, and essentially really breaks down the five main drivers of migration, uh, social, political, demographic, economic, and environmental drivers. And the uh, influence of environmental change and climate change, essentially cutting across those five drivers. And then on the uh, right-hand side of the panel, you have decision, personnel, household, uh, intervening obstacles that mediate that decision, whether people will uh, migrate or um, stay put. So one, my, I believe that many of you are familiar with this, and we're still using this conceptually to theorize around uh, migration and climate change. Um, I think building on that diagram, um, there have been many papers and, and, and debates around migration and security, and obviously um, how climate change will affect uh, people's ability to move. And this has an intrinsic relationship with uh, exposure and vulnerability. Um, I guess what is important to flag here, the two elements, uh, first of which is that um, migrants tend to actually replace um, environmental exposure to environmental stresses, essentially moving from rem uh, rural remote areas into um, urban areas where they become exposed to an entirely, entire, um, entirely different set of um, um, environmental hazards and um, immobility, um, as well as um, trapped populations, um, which obviously become uh, vulnerable to risks uh, related to climate change. Um, but in fact, if we go back to those uh, billion numbers, what we are trying to do in the research that our group has been doing over the, the last 10 years is to understand um, decision-making. And essentially, really, there are a billion micro stories that all migrants that we have interviewed and surveyed tell us. Um, and the diagram here it basically summarizes that um, in terms of what are the sources of insecurity uh, in places of origin and what are the pull factors uh, in places of destination. And you see that the diagram is really telling us a story about uh, environmental exposure to environmental stresses on the one hand and then um, potential uh, livelihood gains or educational gains a destination. And then there, uh, this relationship is mediated by perceived environmental degradation. And this is something that we're going to explore over the next um, slides. If I could move my slides, that is. I can't, let's see, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, Past projections, um, how they map onto those numbers that we've seen at the beginning of the presentation. So I guess the seminal work really here to highlight is Professor Norma Myers, 2002, and then again, 2005, where the first large uh, projection of climate migrants or climate refugees um, uh, made wave um, in much media outlets, as well as in, in academic and policy circles, numbers around 150 to 160 million people displaced by um, sea level rise. Um, those numbers kept increasing over time until um, we got to 2007, when um, the Christian Aid released a seminal report outlining that potentially up to 1 billion people could be displaced. And um, the problem here that uh, the research community on climate change and migration uh, has been flagging is that essentially we have no idea how these numbers were developed. Um, some people tend to say that these are sort of back of envelope calculations or projections based on the number of people living in coastal areas and simply overlaying uh, sea level rise on, on top of that, um, which then again speaks to the point that I was flag um, um, talking about at the beginning, uh, very little agency, so people may 
uh, be able to um, adapt to some of the um, uh, impacts of climate change. There are obviously uh, governmental and institutional um, responses uh, like planned relocation. Um, so these numbers are very, very, uh, or have been debated extensively um, in academic circles. Um, so perhaps what we are trying to do here is to move away from simple uh, projections and try to really understand the underlying factors that um, drive people away from their um, homelands and how climate change becomes potentially one of the key drivers um, for those movements. Um, uh, more recently, I think it was in 2019, uh, Guardian released an article again with a very large number that was contested across um, the academic community, 1.2 billion. The projections were um, based on, again, a range of um, populations exposed to a combination of environmental hazards. Um, those alarmist, um, alarmist numbers actually really quite often tend to highlight uh, transboundary migration or international migration. But in fact, I guess one of the most uh, reputable uh, projections that we have seen recently is the Groundswell Report. Um, they've been focusing really on internal migration and their projections really based on censuses uh, suggest that about 143 million people might be um, displaced and become migrants internally, which is consistent with research. Basically, uh, migration associated with uh, environmental change tends to happen within borders of countries because migration is very costly. People would prefer to stay near their networks, near the, the um, uh, heritage that they know uh, in places that are familiar to them. Um, but what is important here is that really the, the relationship is very complex and is extremely complex and difficult to pinpoint the environmental stressor that is causing people to move away um, from their homelands. So what we're interested really, um, um, and we've been exploring um, over the recent years is the why and how uh, environmental change affects migration decisions. Um, just again, um, as I'm going to be talking about specific uh, climatic processes, it's important to flag the two broader groups um, um, in which we do research, essentially um, examining sudden onset events, those that really tend to generate uh, displacement and forced migration. In some cases, I mean, we can think about Hurricane Katrina, um, people fleeing for their lives, so a massive exodus, and then eventually people returning to their homelands once um, uh, the situation has improved. And on the other hand, um, slow onset events or creeping events uh, such as droughts and changes in monsoon season that deteriorate livelihoods um, over time, uh, reducing people's um, capacity to adapt um, and therefore potentially really generating uh, voluntary migration away from those places. Um, so first we're going to be um, looking at low-lying deltas. Um, this is a research conducted over five years in um, Ghana, Bangladesh and India. Um, and um, what we were trying to, to do here was to understand future decisions and why would people migrate away from the places um, of origin. Um, just to situate um, where research was done, um, four deltas in those three countries, so the Volta Delta in Ghana, the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, um, India and um, Bangladesh, and then the Mahanadi Delta, which was a, a second delta in uh, India. In terms of um, our research approach, uh, we deployed a cross-sectional survey uh, with um, around about 1,668 um, um, respondents that were in fact engaged in migration with um, about 5,500 um, households across the four sites. Um, we've um, surveyed 50 locations in each of the deltas and we sampled um, by exposure to a, a range of environmental hazards. Um, those were um, coastal erosion, saline intrusion, uh, drought, um, changes in monsoon season, um, and in some cases, um, cyclones. Um, of course, um, the Volta Delta uh, is not impacted by cyclones, but 
we know that the GBM and the Maharaji uh, Delta tend to have um, cyclical um, the cyclones that tend to displace um, uh, scores of, of people um, in those places. Um, so going back to that first question that we were trying to answer, the why and how environmental change affects migration decisions, um, we asked respondents to uh, tell us what were the main reasons for migration. Um, given that those places were really exposed to a wide range of um, environmental stresses, um, we thought that we would get um, quite a, a substantial number of people that would say that they have moved or someone in their household moved away because of um, those environmental stresses. But in fact, when we look at the answers, um, it's the opposite, um, or in fact, is consistent with uh, previous research that has been done, um, not just in climate um, climate change migration, but, but equally in terms of migration more broadly, people essentially moving away, uh, seeking employment, um, better education, uh, marriage or family obligations, um, and other problems. So essentially breaking this down into um, economic, educational, and, and family reasons. Um, environmental events, a very small proportion of our respondents across the four sides. In fact, when you look at the numbers, um, and then we're breaking this down, so 60% moving for economic reasons, 12.5 for education, and 9.5 for family obligations, and only 0.6 people, in fact, uh, told us that they moved um, away, or a member of the household moved away because of environmental change. Um, just note that the, we asked them to sort of rank the order, so they could have given us multiple reasons. Uh, but when we uh, um, analyze that data, um, we see that still only 0.6% ranked environmental as the main factor uh, driving people away from, from, from their homes. Um, there is some small variation, uh, regional variation, but for the uh, aggregate uh, data set, that's a, a pretty um, telling number. Uh, which kind of suggested, well, we need to probe this um, a little bit further to understand really to what extent the environment is driving people away from their homes. Um, then we asked um, uh, respondents to comment on perceived levels of environmental change um, in the places that they were living. And the responses were pretty consistent across the four sides. So people do perceive um, changes in the environment, quite often really um, associated with deterioration of environmental conditions, which then um, impact um, livelihood and they perceived uh, greater livelihood insecurity. So this is consistent across the, across the four sides. Um, and when we look at the environmental driver and um, um, for those households that are engaged in migration, uh, we have very, very low numbers, but yet people perceive that the, environmental is, the, the environment is changing and that change causes uh, livelihood insecurity. Um, so just to uh, go back to some of those numbers, um, we asked them um, the main reason for future migration and uh, participants suggested that 78% would just move away again because of economic reasons with only 1.3% of respondents uh, telling us that they would do so because of an environmental um, trigger. Oh, I still can't seem to move this. Um, so what we uh, found was that perceptions uh, of environmental change and livelihood insecurity are high, and therefore those might be the factors that leave, lead people to make a decision to eventually move away. Um, so we did a further um, investigation on this, um, where we ran some um, regression analysis. I'm not gonna really um, put all those tables with uh, statistical figures, because I'm pretty sure that this it's, um, it's for coming to 420 in the afternoon, people don't wanna see uh, those long uh, tables. But what is important to flag here really is the types of answers that we've got and, and we've published a paper on this and I'll flag the paper for people interested in, in reading it. Um, that the perception of drought, for example, across the four deltas reduces the odds of future intention to migrate 
And that is because drought impact um, people's capacity to maintain their livelihoods. Um, migration is a costly endeavor. Therefore, they might have fewer resources to invest in migration, which tends to reduce the odds of people then uh, deciding to migrate. Breaking this down by two um, by specific deltas and the Mahanadi Delta in India, um, changes in monsoon also reduces the odd uh, of um, future migration intention. Again, probably associated with livelihoods. Um, a greater majority or the vast majority of our respondents are dependent on ecosystem-based livelihoods, so fisheries or farmers. Uh, so changes in precipitation do impact their livelihoods. Um, in the GBM, um, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, uh, Magna Delta, and the Volta Delta, uh, the perception of livelihood insecurity reduced the odds of future migration, obviously, again, to do with the economic capacity to deploy migration as um, adaptation to um, climate change or environmental uh, stresses. Um, and what we do see is the socioeconomic determinants are still prevalent. So larger households that, that tend to have a high proportion of migrants, which increases the odds of um, future migration. Um, and um, mi migrant networks, I guess, um, lots of, or many people who are um, watching this uh, presentation might be very familiar with the importance of uh, migration networks and migrant networks. So having those um, net networks available tend to increase the odds by 90%. So that is quite significant uh, value. So this is just essentially to um, tell the story that we've um, outlined at the beginning. There are multiple drivers um, impacting people's decision to migrate away. It is very difficult to isolate uh, the environment or the strength um, of the environmental signal. And we need to basically really evaluate that signal against a range of um, other variables um, and uh, the context um, in which people live um, and the places that people live. So this is the paper that this particular empirical research has um, uh, published. Uh, feel free, it's open access um, and you get more details about um, many of the elements that I discussed um, in the previous slides. So moving away from that, and, and this is something that um, the um, community uh, working on climate change migration has been doing, is just really trying to um, think about mobilities as opposed to migration. Um, and this diagram really here just shows a range of, um, I guess, the wide spectrum of mobility um, that includes um, involuntary mobility all the way through to voluntary migration, displacement, um, areas of uh, policy research and interest, i.e., as I mentioned before, um, planned relocation, resettlement, um, the refugees and internal displacement um, uh, people and, and, and camp situation, um, and other policies that might actually um, address some of those um, dynamics that um, the sort of climate mobility research group is interested in. Um, what we've also um, published recently is that we are just trying to really shift the agenda um, and wanting to explore issues around intersectionality, uh, immobility, immobility and policy responses. Um, what is important here is that uh, human mobility is essentially really a feature of everyday life. Um, and in, if we look at the, the height of the pandemic um, across many countries uh, where people were not able to um, leave their homes or uh, even in, move about um, in terms of their daily lives, this has tremendous impact. Um, and um, we know that climate change or environmental change might actually affect not just long distance um, or permanent or seasonal migration, but those more kind of daily everyday moves that we want to include as part of the research agenda. Um, intersecting factors as well do influence mobility, um, gender, ethnicity, um, class, um, being um, able-bodied. So, uh, so far research has in a sense, neglected those aspects. This is changing now. Uh, there's a stream of new research that is focusing on intersectionality. 
Um, but we've just wanted to position this as one of the areas that is um, important to continue to investigate, really, to what extent climate change will impact um, mobility and migration for those groups. And really, we want to unearth these kind of everyday patterns of short distance and in-country migration and to what extent that those dynamics might be impacted by climate change. Um, so um, this is just a, um, a summary of um, research that we've uh, done um, across uh, various countries um, in Asia, um, South Asia and um, Africa as well. Um, what we're seeing here is just to flag the um, intersectionality and in, in why it matters so much. Um, we still see um, groups, uh, and here is divided by semi-arid um, plateaus, plains, and, and deltas. Uh, so the prevalence remains um, male migration, 83%. Um, so a combined sample size of nearly 7,500 people with only 17% of um, those respondents that are um, have engaged in migration um, being um, females. Um, schooling, obviously, uh, those with um, 10 plus years of school um, have acquired um, higher education or, or, or relevant skills, therefore uh, migrating um, uh, more than groups that are illiterate or um, with a fewer years of formal education. Then younger groups as well, again, all consistent with uh, previous research and um, the wider literature as well, being the groups that tend to migrate um, um, the most. And status, marital status, um, married um, individuals do tend to migrate in many senses. Um, is the male who moves away to um, a larger settlement or the urban center or the capital city uh, to find employment and send remittances back to the family um, in in sort of remote um, areas of those places. Um, important to break down intersectionality and to just really continue to expand that area of research. But as we were talking about migrants to destination, um, parts of research that we've conducted in Bangladesh really try to understand what happens to the migrants once they move from many parts of Bangladesh that are exposed to environmental stresses into a large city. In this case, it's um, Chattagram, um, formerly known as Chittagong. So this is something that sometimes happens when you're doing research projects. The name of a city, the entire city changed. Um, when we started our um, project, it was still Chittagong. And then um, in, with, by the stroke of a pen, it became Chattagram. But this is the spelling um, in Bengali. So um, we welcome that change. Um, what we did in this uh, particular uh, research project was um, to deploy um, participatory visual methods, i.e. in the case, photo voice and photo elicitation. And I just have a, a, a collation of images here that hopefully really uh, tell us the story of migrants moving from places exposed to uh, drought or saline intrusion and into urban areas where they're facing a completely different set of environmental challenges. Um, here you have one of the participants talking about water logging, that this is um, a regular phenomenon in the rainy season in Chattagram and um, affects uh, people's capacity to just move about in the city. Um, migrants, uh, Obviously, uh, finding employment in, in those urban locations, they tend to become exposed to these um, um, areas of um, environmental degradation. Uh, so it's a really complex decision when they leave their homelands and move into um, um, these urban environments. Again, facing um, all sorts of challenges, um, not having agency, uh, living in precarious conditions. Um, um, and um, this one really just flags that some migrants, uh, we interviewed the ethnic minority group in Bangladesh, the Chakma people, they are uh, Buddhists, and they are celebrating here the fact that the municipality um, allowed them to build a temple, which then obviously enabled the community to come together, which was something that they missed, um, not being able to leave uh, in their homelands, which in the uh, Chittagong or Chattagram Hill tract, so the hills of Chittagong. Um, 
I'm just going to try and skip some of these slides here or just be just provide a very quick summary because this is talking really about migrants well-being just trying to understand really um all the um challenges that they face when they move away from their homelands into urban um, spaces uh dignity education material well-being nutrition so um all of these uh, were captured um by the interviews uh, photo licitation and we also ran um a, a survey there, a cross-sectional survey, actually, um, speaking to about 450 migrants. But some of those um, issues really cut across um, um, all um, uh, people that we interviewed. Uh, this is the paper for those of you interested in the, in the more participatory um, qualitative methodology. Uh, it, it does talk about sort of how to respond um, to these uh, precarious conditions that migrant populations face in um, urban settings. Um, I'll skip these slides here. Just uh, this one is important, I guess, is uh, just to really um, position um, why human security is important um, and the elements of human security, uh, place attachment, uh, material and perceived well-being, mental health status, and being exposed to a new set of environmental risks do impact uh, the overall human security of those migrants. So again, it's important to do research, not only in places where um, people live that are exposed to environmental stresses, but also really track those migrants at destination areas and understand uh, the factors that drove them there. So the pool factors, but also how well integrated and adapted they are uh, in that new um, uh, social context. Um, this is the paper that sort of unpacks that. Again, I'm, I'm sure the, these can be made available through the presentation and you can access them. They're all open access. Um, but what I really wanted to kind of bring in towards um, a closure of the presentation is future research pathways. Um, and this is important really because, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're trying to move away from those large number projections, but really understand uh, concepts around tipping points or habitability and um, what are the sort of scenarios uh, that we can generate uh, specifically really for policymakers uh, in terms of climate related migration. So this is a current project that um, I am part of uh, um, amongst uh, this. There are 21 partners from 18 countries. Uh, we have study, uh, country uh, teams based in uh, Ghana, Kenya, Thailand, um, Ethiopia, um, and uh, Mali. Um, and uh, this is ongoing, so I'm going to just provide some very descriptive results where um, we're deploying a, a longitudinal survey. Um, but the objectives really is to understand um, migration patterns, understand um, adaptation options and strategies, and to what extent migration becomes a part of the portfolio of adaptation um, responses that households may deploy. And the tipping points are really important because um, they might change regular um, flows of migration. And I guess this is an important point for policymakers. Um, to what extent and when, uh, what are, by what mechanisms um, existing flows might actually change. Um, and obviously um, we have a greater focus on that intersectional aspect that I highlighted as well throughout the presentation in terms of the of gender and social equity um, dimensions of climate change migration. Um, I'll play this part I will skip is just sort of the architecture of the project, but just there are a number of work packages working across different dimensions of migration and deploying um, a wide range of methodologies. Um, our uh, work package, uh, which is work package one, um, looking at the social ecological systems, climate impacts and tipping points. We are deploying this longitudinal um, survey that I talked about, and we have five research questions, really. Um, one of which is um, attempting to answer and understand changes um, um, in out-migration rates when they become non-linear. What are the sort of the, the tipping points and at what critical value at which those then become non-linear? 
uh, but also looking at adaptive capacity, elements of well-being and mental health that speaks to the uh, research that we've done in Bangladesh. Uh, we're seeking to unpack gender empowerment uh, and inter-household dynamics, so that intersectional aspect within households, and uh, in situ adaptation as well. And just some of the um, uh, we collected, so I'm, I'm just going to talk about uh, three uh, countries. Um, this is based on the first wave of data uh, in Ghana, Kenya, and Mali. Uh, just some of the numbers there. Um, uh, location, um, we have on the map here uh, where households were sampled in those countries. We sampled um, households that had no migration, um, households that had at least one member, but potentially more members who migrated away. Um, and just really to understand uh, the different circumstances for households that do deploy migration as a coping mechanism and those that do not. Um, and some of the results are very consistent with previous results that I've, we've discussed in this presentation. Uh, for example, the vast majority of people um, move um, because of work or income related uh, reasons. This is for the aggregate uh, uh, data set um, for Kenya, Ghana, and, and Mali. Um, educational reasons, again, coming second in, 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 in the drivers, uh, family related in some cases, um a second or third and the environmental aspect uh very um a little number of very few respondents actually flag that as the um main reason uh, main stated reason for migration so this is consistent with with research um and it just again shows us how difficult it is to untangle the environmental um signal within a wide range of um migration drivers. Uh, when we looked at the gender distribution, um, we still see that uh, more males uh, are migrating. Uh, when males migrate, they do tend to do so um, for work or income related reasons. Uh, females, on the other hand, uh, the main reason for migration tend to be associated with family um, uh, commitments or ob obligations. Um, and the spread uh, between education reasons is fairly even between the two genders. Um, adaptive capacity and uh, looking at economic activities, uh, the main activity across those um, the sites that we've uh, surveyed is really uh, crop farming. Um, so heavily really dependent on ecosystem-based livelihoods, which are impacted by um, environmental stresses. Um, I guess the second activity uh, in most cases is non-existent. So they are really uh, relying heavily on um, uh, the ecosystem-based livelihood. Apart from Kenya, which did, had, uh, did have a, a, a larger spread in terms of uh, main activities, uh, including other agricultural activities and um, uh, income associated with pensions or other welfare uh, benefits and um, people being employed in, in the uh, public sector of the economy. So a little more uh, variation in terms of economic activities in Kenya compared, in Kenya compared to Ghana and Mali. Um, my, uh, migration as climate adaptation, um, households uh, have used um, migration as um, adaptation. Um, and then you see the spread of where they go, they tend to um, migrate um, outside. Um, in some cases, those changes have um, increased. Um, and um, it was quite high and quite surprising. And we're still unpacking the uh, mobility within district. So just really that local aspect of mobility, short distance, short duration, um, that is important to be explored uh, in future research. Um, and I guess uh, just in terms of in situ adaptation, because obviously some households may not be able to deploy migration. This um, is what we were uh, looking at at the beginning. So households that are immobile or are trapped uh, might rely heavily on these in situ 
uh, strategies. Um, and the responses are quite diverse, but uh, they seem to be, if there is a climate shock, um, they just hope for the best, which unfortunately uh, suggests that the capacity, the adaptive capacity is very limited and equally limited is uh, the policy responses that might be deployed uh, to address um, the climate shock that, that those households are exposed to. Um, and uh, when they thinking about uh, future climate change, uh, they don't think that uh, they strongly disagree with um, question number five, that the current solutions existing um, uh, will be sufficient to deal with uh, the impacts of climate change. So we just really see that those households might actually really start to deploy in some cases migration, or they might become trapped just because they have very limited um, adaptive capacity. Um, and are not supported by um, the institutions in their countries. Um, so just to conclude, um, when we are thinking uh, in terms of a conceptual framework, is that migration moving from just a simple coping mechanism, but to actually become uh, an adaptation strategy? And what are the sort of mechanisms that do facilitate that uh, or impact that um, change? Um, I've flagged here um, when it goes from being uh, a coping, so when remittances are low, uh, they are employed in the informal sector of the economy. We're looking at short-term uh, moves of um, um, and uh, really autonomous adaptation um, um, measures. If coherent adaptation migration policies and programs are um, deployed, uh, fully supported by institutions and governments, we might actually see migration becoming a viable um, adaptation response, which is the desired outcome uh, where remittances are high, uh, migrants are employed in the formal sector of the economy, um, we have um, improvement of translocal ties. So uh, translocality becomes a factor where um, multiple livelihoods can be um, obtained, but both at um, places of origin and destination with strong connections um, and teleconnections between the two um, um, locations. Um, and access to planned in situ options, which uh, would be facilitated by governments and institutions. Um, there's also really, uh, I guess, uh, important to highlight um, safety nets um, and access for uh, to frontline services, basic services, uh, which would then provide be provided by states um, um, in where migration becomes um, a viable um, adaptation response. So just the concluding remarks then. Um, what we've discussed throughout this presentation is that migrants do negotiate uh, multiple risks and they're making decisions based on uh, difficult trade-offs um, and deciding when migration becomes a preferred option. Um, policies uh, have to sort of overcome this rural urban binary and be realigned with translocal livelihoods. So people actually really um, being very mobile um, across the world, but particularly in places in the global south that are and will be exposed to climate change. So how, how to engage with translocality and translocal livelihoods. Um, explore pathways, pathways, uh, pathways to reconfigure um, how host communities view and depend upon migrants. This is to do with communities that might be relocated or resettled elsewhere. Uh, so in a sense, um, uh, they, ways to deal with um, or minimize conflict by those relocations and, and resettlement. And really move away from migration um, as seen as a, as a permanent form of adaptation, but rather uh, towards mobility, which is desired, uh, doesn't need to be managed um, like migration is, particularly in, in the global north, um, and just treat as a long-standing feature of everyday life that might become more recurrent and prevalent um, because of climate change. So with that, I'll park my um, presentation here and I'm um, very happy to take answers for uh, take questions from from the audience. Thank you very much.